It's been a minute since we've we done this. It has been a minute. These things really are good. too good. Really good. Ooh. Probably one of the best snacks we've had in a long time. It's just definitely Probably. one of the better ones. And also, I'm saying that because I feel like we haven't recorded an episode in a really long time. <laughs> That's fair. You're listening to The John Chi Show, hosted by three Korean-American adoptees diving headfirst into what it means to be adopted, Korean, American, and more. And now, here's your host, Nathan, Patrick, and KJ. Welcome back to The John Chi Show. We are back. We are here. Well, two of us are here. My name is Nathan, <laughs> Nathan Nowak, and my co-host here, KJ Rilke. We're What's missing up? Patrick because this is kind of a spur of the moment intro. It's a it's a late, it's like a last minute thing <laughs> because we forgot how to do our own show. And both Patrick and I had night commitments. And so here we are doing the thing. Uh, Patrick is still well he's probably I hope he's in bed at least now uh, <laughs> it's late like you're hearing this hours after it was recorded so he's true happy listening I think Patrick's still recovering from his uh, hot ones challenge but that's a whole other story <laughs> so if anybody caught that I don't know go uh, to, to Hannah's uh, um, Facebook or uh, uh, sorry Instagram, uh, Instagram yeah. and there's a really funny um, yeah I can't believe he did it again. Uh, again, I thing. know that yeah. I can, she did it again. I mean, just the fact of <laughs> yeah, that's of true. How actually, how painful that probably is. I was very impressed. Well, and this uh, time they had two guests. They had Eric and Leah on the show. Yes, on the show, on the live. Oh, um, yeah. But uh, I assume <laughs> they met for the first time in real life at the John Chi Show live show. So yeah, that was cool. I didn't. I didn't know that they were going to see see each other, and and then they hopped in, and I was like, "Oh, hey, it's my friends that I met recently, <laughs> and my friends that I've known for slightly longer." I know. So, yeah, that's cool. And now I get to watch them uh, in pain. I get to watch them all, yeah, <laughs> suffer suffer horribly. <laughs> but they made some money for 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 Nam, and uh, some people donated money while they were doing it, which was funny. They said, "Take another." Take another shot of the, <laughs> take another bite of that hot sauce, and I'll, oh, I'll pitch in ten fifty or ten to fifty dollars or something like that. I don't know. I think there was a lot of money donated, but I don't know if it was. It still looked very painful. So, but yeah, I commend well, that's them for doing But that's that. not what this show was about, Nathan. What is this show? Oh, about? yes, true. This is a different show. We are not eating hot sauce on our show. We we are do eat later. Tasty things on our show, <laughs> specifically for uh, you know. Spoiler Hopefully, alert. not painful things. Yeah. Spoiler alert: the snack we had uh, on this episode was really good. So. Um, it uh yes we are the john g show we are three korean adoptees um spread out across the nation and we are here exploring our uh korean adoption heritage and identities and stories and uh and other people's stories and yeah. having a snack absolutely so john g means to feast uh and you can't really feast without a celebration. So uh, that's what we do. We, we feast and we celebrate. And that's why we call ourselves the John G Show. Uh, today, we have a very special guest. Her name is Sarah Streeter. Sarah, um, graciously, <laughs> we talk about this a lot, but uh, filled out the <laughs> guest form and then came on the show much later than really any of us intended. Uh, but it was it was a really fantastic conversation. We talk about um just her story growing up in the mid Atlantic States um, through going back to Korea uh, and her journey into becoming a writer and working towards um, writing as like a, I guess we didn't really clarify with her, but what I'm going to say is a side hustle slash passion project slash kind of therapy, but she's a really incredible writer. So I'm going to plug it again. Um, Go to sarahjstreeter.com. You can find her published works there. Um, Follow her on Instagram. Uh, I think she's at street street um spelled like the street um yeah it just i mean we get into it but like mm-hmm. her her writing still is resonating with me days later um it's just really profound and uh and i immediately like jumped off and i was like sarah you have to read some of this my sarah not not sarah sarah <laughs> yeah. not the one who wrote it but yeah it was just it was really really good yeah and, and she's just a very great great gracious person uh really nice and it was a lovely conversation think, yeah we uh, had a lot of fun yeah we had we had a good time so um definitely enjoyed this interview and really appreciated that she came on yep so without further ado here is that tape roll it 
Welcome back to the John Chi Show, everyone. Um, this is our interview section with Sarah Streeter, who filled out the form, the guest form, a year ago, and is just now coming <laughs> on to the show. Thank you very much for your patience and your willingness to still come on after we unintentionally ghosted you. How are you? I am really good. I'm really good. I am. I probably gained like 20 pounds from Thanksgiving, um, but. I'm good, tired, a little tired, but good. Perfect. Well, we're really thrilled to have you on the show. Um, so will you kick off this whole section the way we uh, normally do and tell us your story? Okay, here we go. Um, so I've been thinking about this, and I actually feel like my story has like started a little bit before I like came on the scene, right? Like for a lot of us, too. Like there's like something that happened or like someone wasn't able to have a baby or whatever. So like... So my dad was married previously for like 20 years, three daughters, and then he got divorced and he wanted to start a new life with my mom. So what do they do? Oh, get a baby from Korea. So <laughs> The classic first option. You know. yeah, you're like, what? What, should, what is, is there a thing we can do? What about adoption? Is that yeah, one of those so. date night cards? <laughs> That's what the birds and the bees is really about is actually adoption. The birds and the bees adopted a rabbit. <laughs> um, yeah, so I they so yeah I was born in eighty two uh, in Daegu, and then I went up to they I went up to Seoul, and then flew over to Dulles Airport in Virginia, and that's where I met my parents. And uh, yeah, I have my three older sisters who are half sisters. They're like a lot older. Like as I mentioned, my dad was married for like 20 years. My oldest sister is like in her 60s. She's like retiring. Um, yeah. So it's, and I have nieces and nephews who are like not that much younger than me, which is pretty wild. Um, and yeah, so it was a pretty good life. Like, um, like, all the things grew up in like super white uh, areas, Northern Virginia, and then um, Southern Virginia, Williamsburg. If you've probably heard of it, probably Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah, that's where mm. I went to high school. Not Colonial Williamsburg, but like Williamsburg. <laughs> high school. I, went to, I went to Williamsburg in the 1700s. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, there's like normal people there. I'm like, yeah, it's like there's like, it's like an actual town, you know, there's like the Colonial Park. Is ye olde oh, there's <laughs> normal people there. <laughs> I know. That's what people think. Um, so yeah, that's where I went to high, middle school and high school. And then, um, went to the University of Delaware and uh, basically stayed in like the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and now I'm in Maryland and mm. Silver Spring, Maryland outside of DC um, with my husband and my two kids. So suburb life is where it's at. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's kind of short, but um, no, that's, that's great. Um, <laughs> congratulations on your second kid. I know that we Thank didn't you. talk to you beforehand, <laughs> but when you filled out the form, you, you had filled out the you form were for a second kid. child. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the one and the other one is coming. So. <laughs> and he's here. I mean, we weren't going to interview her while she was going into labor or things like that. So <laughs> that would be wild. We're not that kind of show. We're not that kind of show. Period. Where you know, where she reached out to us and says, "Yeah, I'm." <laughs> Nathan's be... trying to clean up that. If you <laughs> fill out our form, it's we okay. will get to you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> For any future guests, just uh, if you're, you're heard heard having a baby mail? in between it, yes, we, we I can feel postpone like... the interview for you. <laughs> I feel like that I've. Were we have maybe have met or know that of each multiple other. Korean adoptees ended up in your area? Did you know any or were connected to any adoptees growing up? Uh, not growing up. Um, there was one girl in my high school that we were not friends. We did not run in the same social circles. But in Silver Spring and like D.C., there's like a lot. Like actually mm. the adoption agency. So my parents lived, actually lived in Silver Spring when they adopted me. And the adoption agency that they adopted me through, which worked with Eastern, um, they are now this other um, organization. They've turned into this other organization that my daughter goes to culture school at, if well, that makes any sense. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so it's, like, all connected. Um, there's, like, a ton of a, a Korean, a Korean adoptees, like, Chinese adoptees and stuff in the area, which is really cool. Um 
yeah. So I've been able to like link up and do sorts of all sorts of adoptee related stuff around here. So you said the agency is now a cultural school. They so they do like culture stuff. Um, they have like a, a summer camp for like teens, and they have um, like just like monthly classes for mm. adoptees, like Korean adoptees, and then like adoptees, like adult adoptees with kids, which is kind of funny, you know. So um, it's also really kind of awkward because you know you're around all these like white adoptive parents too. Sure. So. <laughs> it's been kind of interesting you know it's like kind of like a fly in the wall sometimes like peering in on on things but um yeah so it's, it's a it's a pretty great community for that um i've been i sort of like started getting into it like 2016 i think we were living in dc and like one day i was like oh like i wondered if i just looked on facebook to see if there's like any adoptee groups and like lo and behold they're like a gazillion and so like i went to like my first meetup and like oh okay um so oh yeah the rest of my story sorry a little tired um so i totally forgot the reunion part so uh so i went to this meetup and um i talked to like i never this is my first one i never like met other like korean adoptees and i talked to like three people who had found their families and i was like Mm what the fuck like why have i done this i should do this so i i you know reached out to anyways i reached out i got in touch um with a social a social worker she reached out to eastern um eastern sent me my paperwork which i had my parents had like i had seen it before of course my parents had never showed it they still never showed me it's in a green folder in their top drawer in their desk Mm. Um, I haven't shown it to you, but you know exactly where yeah, it is. I know in exactly the color where of the it folder. is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like went and took a whole bunch of pictures of it the other day. Um, and um, yeah, and then um, I did the whole thing where we send the telegram or whatever. And then they, you know, we did that twice and I was starting to lose hope. So in 2017, 2016, I, um, I got a phone call. Um, it was a social worker and she was like, it was right before my birthday. My birthday is in December. Um, and she said, um, we looked in your file in your, in, at Eastern in Korea and all of your, all of your information is there. She's like your sister's name, your parents' names, they were married, um, and everything. Um, wait, sorry. I'm really tired. You are good. No, <laughs> I'm, no getting out of, I'm getting out of order now. Um, anyways, they found my family. Um, I exchanged letters with my, um, birth mother. Um, and she said all the things she, that you want them to say, right. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm so sorry. I've been looking for you. Um, you have, yeah, I have five sisters. I have five older sisters, uh, both sisters. Uh, and, uh, she's like, she had to tell my sisters that I was alive. Because when she had me, she told them I died. So she had to like go through that process, um, which took some time and then um, got back to me. Um, and at that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Korea. So I went to Korea um, and I was able to meet with her and four of the five of my sisters um, in 2017 when I was pregnant. So mm. with my daughter. So yeah, that was that was pretty uh, momentous and crazy. Um, And the funny thing is, is that I haven't really stayed in touch with them. Um, My older sisters are, I don't speak Korean. First of all, they don't speak English. Cacao, Papago, very limiting, very Mm -hmm. limiting. Um, But uh, my youngest sister, she, so I guess somehow, my birth mother introduced us on, on, um, cacao. And so we, we talk a lot, but I've never met mm. her. <laughs> she was the mm. one who wasn't there. Um, she's like, I don't know, three years older than me. She has a daughter. Um, and she lives in Deku and we exchange pictures and just like life updates, small things. And, um, yeah, it's just really strange that we have, like, we've been texting each other since like, or whatever, 2019, something like that. So years, right? Um, I want to meet her, but uh, you know, it's kind of hard with two young kids. And um, yeah, 
Well, and like a pandemic and just like literally every single thing that's happening in the world right now. Absolutely. No, absolutely. So it's, it's been like a really big journey. I definitely like grieved a lot in terms of like, like I had a whole family um, and, mm, yeah. and not the funny thing, but the the thing is, is that in my paperwork, it said I was illegitimate. Um, my parents were married, you know, said I was illegitimate. It didn't list my father mm. um, lies, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And actually when my parents found out about that, they felt really deceived. They felt really mm. like, Oh my God, we were lied to. And I just thought it was really interesting. I'm like, well, yeah, but like, what about me? Like, <laughs> right. You're like, hi, still present. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like weird. Um, so that was, that was an interesting thing. But yeah, I just, I grieved not missing out on this family, like a whole family uh, with full, full siblings. Um, still, still definitely feel sad, but you know, a lot of therapy and stuff. So working through that. So at that time, I was working um, as an interior designer, like. Uh, like a commercial hospitality interior designer. So it's like pretty high stress. Um, you have to work with developers and there's a lot of money involved and, um, you know, architects and stuff, but there's a lot of rolling deadlines. It's like really, really stressful. Um, mm. And uh, so in 2019, I, I went to another firm and it was still really stressful. I was traveling a lot. I was actually going to Dallas um, pretty frequently and um, for like day trips, okay. So like Maryland to <laughs> oh, Dallas. Oh, good. It's the casual day trip to <laughs> Dallas. For day trips, that was terrible. Right. Um, and I was like, I came home one day and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Like it was like the stress of sort of like processing this like family stuff, and mm. then um, the, the stress of work on top of that. I just, or I, I never felt good enough in the first place, right? And um, so I just like. I was like, I can't do this. So my husband and I, like we worked out a plan and I was able to quit. Uh, I took like a, a, a mental break. I don't know. or something like that for like six months and then um, started working again in a totally different field. So um, yeah, it was weird how the grief or whatever kind of like snuck up on me years later. Um, I think it's like such a big life change when you think your whole life like fit you're never going to meet anyone who looks like you or like anyone who shares your DNA. And suddenly you have this entire family, but you can't really even know them. It's just like, Mm -hmm. what? (laughs) And you can't communicate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want to communicate with my family like so much more, but that, that barrier restricts me and makes me feel you know, frequently guilty actually that I, that I'm not learning Korean or that yeah. I'm not, you know, oh, um, yeah. reaching out more often than I, than I feel I should. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I really appreciate you sharing that with us because I think what's really interesting is that it all started from, or what I picked up on from that initial meetup after joining the Facebook yeah. group and yeah. seeing, Oh, there's multiple people who have had this experience. Yeah. Why not me too? Yeah. And then it kind of led you onto that journey And I wanted to kind of go back to that moment and ask about the impetus to start searching for community. Was that something that you had been interested in prior to that, like, like unpacking your identity and things like that? Or had you, was this something that just kind of, like you talked about the grief snuck up on you? Like, Oh, this is something I need to. Yeah. It was kind of like that. Like I was, I remember it was like a summer day. I was sitting on my couch. And I was just like, oh, I'm going to do this. And like, yeah, it just snuck up on me. It was never, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It was just one day. I think, you know what it was? It was probably like we were starting to talk about having a family and moving to the mm-hmm. suburbs. And, you know, like for a lot of like, like females, like a lot of us are just like, oh, like I'm going to have a kid. And then you start thinking about all the stuff that goes along with it. Like, you know. I know before I kind of felt like I had appeared out of thin air. And then if you think about, Oh God, there's like an actual like physical process. And then you think about all <laughs> like, like apparently I just ate it somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really bizarre thought. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that may have been actually what, now that you asked that question, that's probably where it came from. Well, I guess as a follow up to that too, was that kind of thought, was it, I want to seek out my Korean heritage and community or was it, I want to find other adoptees who have had that experience? I think, I think it was adoptees. And I think mm. that's kind of for me still kind of the thing. Like, sure. I definitely, like when I went to Korea, I was, 
pregnant, right? So, and I had like pretty bad um, nausea and like all of the morning sickness stuff. And like when I was there, I I was not really interested in the food, right? I wanted to eat my comfort food. I wanted to eat (laughs) Italian food. I wanted to eat, you know, bagels with cream cheese and, you know, French fries with like Old Bay on them, right? So I, I was not like super into the korean <laughs> like the korean <laughs> korean stuff yeah. i didn't and i and i i didn't really feel like i really fit in that well i think mm. i i appreciate and really enjoy like the adoptee community um that kind of like third culture you know like like sure. you heard of, like third culture kids like i feel like it's kind of like that you know mm-hmm. and that's kind of where i find community i think for sure because like i i really I'm not super interested in learning Korean. I'm not very good mm. with languages. I know I'll never uh, really fit in there. Like, I just, I just don't think I ever would. So, yeah, I, I think I relate to the adoptee community the best. Yeah, for sure. Well, and it's hard to, I think, like have that perspective of like this is like an uphill battle for not that great of a thing. In terms of, uh, what am I saying? Not reward, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's a lot of struggle to get to like, not even like the middle places, you know? Yeah. Like, like there's yeah. no, it's not a good ROI, that. like a return on your Thank investment you. yes. of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's just like, but I also have this other community where I don't have to work super hard and I am accepted and I, I can yeah. be naturally in that space, which I think is really, really wonderful. Yeah. And I totally, totally get that. Like it's, I think a thing that I wrestle with personally is like, how much effort do I want to put into this? Uh, wait, how much effort do I feel like I should put into mm. learning about my, mm. you know, birth country, learning the language, whatever, any of that kind of stuff versus like how much of that like is personally interesting? How much of that like, do I feel some sense of like ghost family duty? Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause that's yeah, where they yeah. are essentially, right? Like they're just like ghosts. They're, it's such a, a familial piety to a ghost family. And you're like, well, you're not even really going to exist necessarily until you find out that they do. So yeah, I get that. So you reached out to the Adoptee community and you, uh, it sounded like talking about having a family was the, was the impetus for reaching out to your (coughs) adoptee community and trying to find people who've been through that. And then hearing adoptees be in reunion was like, Oh, well maybe I should try that out. What was, the relationship like with your family as you went on that journey, specifically, I guess, with your parents and with your mm-hmm. partner. Mm-hmm. So my partner, David is, so he's been like amazingly supportive. Actually, this is funny. So on our first date, so we've been together for like 12 years, right? We met on Mac actually, which is hilarious. Um, okay. Our first date, he was like, I like walked in we're, we're at a, um, like a CKZ, like cocktail mm. bar. It was really, it's not very classy. And, it wasn't um, colonial. Very classy. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a colonial thing, guys. It's a normal no. speakeasy. Exactly. Very speakeasy. common in the mid Atlantic states. <laughs> um, and he was like, I, you know, one of his first questions was like asking me about my adoption. And I was like, oh my God, like, I don't talk to anyone about this. Like, I was at that point in my life when I did not talk about that, you know? Um, and it was just like, I didn't know how to take it. So he is, his mom is Mexican, his dad is Vietnamese. So he's sort of been, struggling, you know, wrestling with these cultural, racial identities his entire life. And he's very, like, forthcoming about them. So for him to ask about those things, like, it, it didn't, it wasn't that, like, crazy to him. But, you know, like, to, like, some of us, it's like, what? Whoa, like, <laughs> slow down. Like, do you know what you're on earthing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so he's been amazingly supportive. He can relate in so many ways. Um, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have a partner like him. And then my parents, I, I told them, um, about it after I'd found my family. Um, and they were supportive, which was, which was great. Um, I will tell you that, so I do a lot of writing, um, and trying to just get my, my words out there in sort of the mainstream writing community actually. And, um, my parents don't know, (laughs) Mm. they don't know that I have this whole other secret life. Um, I, uh, I just, 
they're kind of on the older side and I just don't want to, I don't want to hurt them and then have them pass away or something. You know what I mean? Sure. Like hmm. I would just, I would, I'd be destroyed um, if that were to be the case. So right for now, at least that's what I'm doing. I'm just kind of have, have my two selves. Um, kind of weird. <laughs> how do you, how do you find yourself balancing that? It's, it's stressful because, um, the, the writing to me, like, is like, like the best thing I feel like I've discovered, like one of the best things in my life. Um, and I really, really love it. And I'm super, super proud. And, um, and I think my, my mom's a big reader and I feel like she would be really supportive, but I just, the things that I'm writing about, um, I just, I just don't know. I, so I have definitely struggled, you know, with that, um, just kind of keeping such a big secret, keeping this other self from them. Is it curious, fair? Sir. Oh, go for it, Nathan. I was going to say, I'm curious on how you keep it secret or how, do you, uh, do you know if your parents haven't seen it? Because I mean, I know your website is your name. Um, My name. By the way. Yeah. So, and also, by the way, so not, not it's not like, like I don't know how often your parents name. Google you. I, yeah, but. maybe they don't know Google. Maybe they don't own a computer. I don't know. They're like, I don't know. Ever since I asked you, in a way, I don't know how to use it. Because I don't know if you know this, but your website is your name. <laughs> Jeez. Well, now I know. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I'm, I'm curious. Oh, wait, by the way, going back to your, your 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 uh, um your work, it is amazing. I read. Oh, I, I think I read like six or seven of them today so um oh. very very great uh, great work and i yeah it's very moving Thank um you. i can see your hesitation on why you wouldn't <laughs> want your your parents to see some of that just very similar yeah. things and i i thought about it as well and i was when i was reading it i was like would how would my parents feel if they read this too and that's my parents yeah. not even you know whereas your parents this, these are stories really about you and about your yeah. your history and, yeah and so absolutely um, so has anyone in your family reached out um, about it? That they've no. seen it? No. So, no. So my parents, I've, I've just blocked my parents from certain things on socials. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to Google me. You know, I don't really, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really like, go, I don't, I don't really have a Facebook. I do have a Facebook, but I really only use it for like the group. Like I'm in like two groups, right? I mm -hmm. don't have any friends really. Um, so yeah, it's, I was able to just kind of like, um, just block them from certain things on socials and um actually them and other family members um okay so yeah and well I just, when you're doing oh sorry no, go, no that go ahead i was just gonna say when you're doing something that's vulnerable like writing where it's hard to to mask that or hide that in certain ways and you have to put up boundaries because again like i feel the same i feel similar to how when i write and definitely not as professionally as a lot of other people. I'm just throwing shit on LinkedIn um, <laughs> and then repurposing it for my Instagram. But, um, you know, I, I feel like it's been it's been interesting navigating that with my parents, especially my mom, because she's yeah. first off, I didn't realize until recently my mom didn't know how to swipe through a carousel. So she would just <laughs> think that this was just oh. the one thing. <laughs> oh. I'm like, oh, perfect. This oh, is amazing. No. And uh, she's going to listen to this episode now and be like, I can't believe you said that about me. But it's just so she thinks your Instagram is always just a photo of you doing this. Yeah. It, and there's nothing bit. else yeah. behind it. Um, she's figured it out, though. She's getting, <laughs> she's getting there. Um, but it, it is always interesting, you know, like what you can give away when you know that your family or even your close friends or people that are in your circle are going to see these things. And even from like the adoption standpoint is one or the perspective is one thing, but especially when I start to talk about like anti-racism stuff, like anti-blackness, especially like, it's like, how, how is this going to land? And it took me a really long time to get to the point of being like, I don't really care. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day though, I totally resonate with what you're saying about like, what if my parents read this and it like destroyed the bedrock of, our relationship yeah. you know i do i do think about that and there are certain things that i my parents don't read or my mom does not see that you know isn't like directly criticizing any specific thing but it's just you know there's some things that you keep close to the chest and yeah. Yeah. you know it's mm -hmm. not really it's not necessarily for anybody out wider than what you want it to be and so you yeah. have to be able to put up those boundaries and i think it's too 
my parents' credit uh, and then to anybody else who's willing to, from an adoptive parent standpoint, to respect those boundaries. Because I think it's hard to get to that point because it feels like, again, through adoption, like there's this certain sense of like filial piety, like you had talked about, where they should be privy to these thoughts or these words or whatever it is that you're sharing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, that's not the case. Like those are our things. And one of the ways that we can reclaim stuff is by setting these boundaries and being able to operate on our own, um, with the knowledge that, Hey, this is, you know, not necessarily for you. So yeah, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I appreciate that. And yeah. I thought I was going to ask a question, and then I was just like, I'm running out of steam. And you're, <laughs> so one of the things I appreciated about your writing, which is something that you specifically stated that is a goal of yours, is to write for the adoptee community to, um, you know, to understand your story and maybe their their own stories and get more of their writing out and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely sounds like you, I think you even commented it, that it is a kind of a form of therapy for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When did you realize that when you first started it or was starting it part of that process or did you just really, cause you said you've always loved writing yeah. you know, English major yeah. and stuff too. Oh yeah. That's what I wrote in my thing and my yeah. form. Okay, <laughs> cool. This um, is yeah. Good job, Sarah from last year. Um, <laughs> I know Google. <laughs> Okay, you don't have to brag, Nathan. (laughs) Not all of us can figure it out, okay? Um, Let's see. So I, when I was like a teenager, I wrote a lot in a lot of journals. um, And it's just because I couldn't like talk to my parents about any of this stuff. So I was like, oh, I got to get it out. I'm going to explode. And then, yeah, so I was an English major, but I didn't do anything with it then. Like, and I wasn't like brave enough or... um, like in touch with myself enough to like really write about it, I guess. Um, so I guess around early 2021, I took a, did a little like workshop with Lauren Sharkey and mm-hmm. whoop, whoop. Jennifer uh, Holcomb Patel, which is how I know her. Um, and uh, I sort of started writing um, from that workshop on um, and yeah, I just, and then I took this adoptees, uh, adoptive voices, um, like class. I don't even know what to workshop, I guess it is. Um, they have like all these different cohorts and it's just adoptees on Zoom and you write and then you talk about it. Um, so I started doing that. And um, I think that's where I sort of really got like the therapeutic aspect of it. Um, just hearing other people and um, everyone like gets it, you know? Um, so yeah, it's been super therapeutic. Like, I just had um, a piece accepted that's going to be published in, um, they said winter 2023. So I assume like January or something like that. Um, and Congrats. It's a piece, thank you. Um, it's a, it's a very short piece. It's about my relationship with my, um, my sister, the one I haven't met yet. And um, I, I really loved it. I have loved it this whole time. Um, it's got, yeah, I got rejected like six or seven times. I was like, I really feel strongly about this. And so I, I edited it, I got it out and then I had acceptance and really kind words. And like, it was like the strangest feeling. It felt like I had just like released a part of myself in the wild. Like it felt so good. Like I was like in tears. I don't know why, you know, just to, I guess the, the validation, you know, someone saying, yes, I get this. Um, it felt good. I was just going to say, like, I, I like, it sounds like validation to me. Like, yeah. it sounds like, you know, it's like my voice, especially going through that process, getting those multiple rejections and yeah. finding, finding that breakthrough. Like, yeah. that sounds like validation to me. And yeah. honestly, just hearing you talk about it made me kind of like get hyped up. I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like, I mean, just humans need that, that validation, need someone to believe in. Um, and I think with adoptees, there's a lot more to it. Uh, and there's a, like the, the projection is a little heavier. The validation yeah. is harder. It means yeah. more. And I wonder, like, I mean, personally, sometimes I, I also have trouble accepting it. Mm-hmm. Like no matter how many times I'm some externally validated, I'm like, yeah. uh, like, you know, I have those, those questions of worthiness, but I think it's, it's a really special thing to, to put yourself into a work and send it out into the world and hear that it resonates with someone. Yeah. Um, I think Especially it's really wonderful personal work that is the mm-hmm. story in a way. I mean, I don't know how many, uh, 
the your writings i don't know how is it a hundred percent um accurate of things that you um coming directly from you yeah you're, you're not this isn't uh yeah it's all um, so he's asking like if it's like metaphorical or yeah. fictional oh. in any nature or if it's yeah, like it's correct like more like memoir yes like yeah uh, <laughs> i could see why that how that was getting confusing potentially so yeah. uh, i saw so, kj go huh? yeah pull, um, pull me that what, puppy dog what because you I talk have... about you know you talk about dreams you talk about videos from your your family in korea yeah. you talk yeah uh, that's true those are true um the one piece i talk about it's um my sister sent me a video um of my of her my birth mother and my niece making um uh dalgona i don't even know how to mm-hmm. say it properly yeah um the candy from yeah the Squid game from oh, Quick game. yeah oh, okay yes. yeah well, i was like did we have I'd it on the that. show though yes, not to be confused dalgona? with the coffee yeah yeah. <laughs> so, yeah we did do it on the show yeah and so they're they're making it and you can't really see them um and they make it into like a little my niece like forms it into like a little heart um and Mm -hmm. it's and she's like happy like that's like they're kind of speaking in korean of course i can't understand it and um i know my my birth mother's there because i can i can i I hear her voice i know what it sounds like because i've met her and then yeah she forms it in a little heart and she's like happy and then it kind of ends and it's just like i watched that video so many times um so the piece i wrote about it was like I inserted myself as a fantasy into mm-hmm. this moment with them. Um, I've never met my sister. I've never been in her house. <laughs> I've never made Dalgon- Dalgona before, but I I watched this video and I want to be there, you know, with them. So that was that. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. That was like, I cried so many times writing that piece. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, yeah, super, super personal, but yeah sort of fantasy right like mm-hmm. i mean i in some ways like our lives are kind of that weird in between and i like to play with that what allows us to live out those what if scenarios you know yeah. like we yeah. all struggle or work through or or find a way to walk with and yeah it's tough i think but it, i think that's the beauty of writing or words in general and storytelling yeah. is being able to insert yourself in those places and let that play out in a specific way um, I wanted to ask you about the Adoptee Voices cohorts and what that experience was like to sit with other adoptee writers. Was that the first time you had experienced that type of yeah. writing situation where yeah. it was specifically at purely adoptees and the adoptee voice? Totally. Yeah. Um, super great. I highly recommend it. It's super, it's just like so powerful. You hear people's stories. I mean, um, you know, everyone's so talented, um, and everyone's stories are amazing. I mean, and it's, it's so interesting too, because I feel like so many of us have stories that it's like, uh, so actually, so this is, um, it's all adoptees, right? So it's like domestic and, um, like, uh, transracial and intercontinental and like everyone together. Um, so everyone has like really unique stories, um, that, that it's like, they're unbelievable. Some of them are unbelievable. And it's, and some of the coincidences and that kind of thing, um, and how they search and the reunions and all that stuff. Um, but we all know that this is what happens. Like these are people's real lives and, um, the stories are, are real. Um, so it's, it's an amazing community. Yeah. So I, I went to your website and I looked up the piece and I'm just like kind of sitting in some of it. Um, just like even even breezing over because they're all really short pieces and they're really punchy and I think that that's really lovely and um yeah I don't know yeah. and then something you said oh you said when you were describing like the writing process and your inspiration for Dalguna um that you were like oh I, and I heard my birth mother's voice and I know her voice and that just really struck me like what what a beautiful thing to know and what a thing that so many of us take for granted, you know, like I could be sent a video of my family Mm -hmm. who who are my literal flesh and blood. And I would have no idea who was speaking the relationship, you know, any of that. So yeah, yeah, sorry. I just got caught up in my own separate (laughs) adoptee moment. That's all. (laughs) So I actually, Oh, Dave, do you have something? I was just going to talk about how I, I, um, your, your piece erased was uh, really moving too. how you talked about um, 
your body parts disappearing as you're traveling. Yeah. You know, and that kind of metaphorically <laughs> disappearing no, over. No, that was that was real. She's uh, <laughs> she's just a floating head. This is a robot that's body. It. That's all we can see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like watching an episode of Futurama right now. Yeah, I know. I'm like the but, um, that that was very beautiful too and moving. And you even used some terminology in it that, that really got me thinking. You used uh, um, a phrase the transcontinental adoption pipeline. Mm, yeah. Which I've never heard anyone say that. And it, it was both it made me mad and, and, and <laughs> amazed at the same time because <laughs> of that word. I was like, Whoa, it's a word I've, that, because you know, the, just so much about that. Um, uh, you know, where's my question in this? <laughs> I was just going to say, how do you write good? How do you write this so well? Where, is, where does this, where do these words come from? Yeah. I mean, what inspires you with some of these? I mean, I know you're writing about your stories and stuff, but are certain things that pop into your head just like, um, like, like talking about your limbs racing and you know what <laughs> inspires those types of things? Um, so for that one, I had a, a quote um, from um, "On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous" by Ocean. Mm. Uh, I still don't know how to say his last name, Yong Bong, um, the Vietnamese author and um, Vietnamese American author. And he's um, so talented. Uh, And uh, whatever quote it was, I can't remember exactly words, the words, but the quote is at the top of my piece. And it just stuck with me. Like I wrote it down. I was just thinking about how, how we were all like erased, like parts of us were erased gradually, you know, and (coughs) Um, that's where that inspiration came from. Um, everyone's coughing. Um, and, uh, <laughs> we're all sick now. <laughs> yeah, we all just finished a run and we're still burning out the engine. It's fine. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just have these weird little thoughts. Sometimes I, I, my husband will say something that sounds, he won't even be talking about anything really serious, but it'll like just come out as like poetic. Um, or I'll mm-hmm. see something on Twitter and uh, like a, I saw this picture of this pine cone, okay? And it had been in like an, a, a forest fire. But the pine cone on the inside burned for, for like days after the fire because it's like contained. So anyways, little things like that like get me thinking and I, um, I just like write them down or I put them on my phone like um, and then just come back to it. My brain just makes weird associations with things. Well, I really, really enjoy writing. And I think that, Obviously, reunion has to do or plays a big part in terms of inspiration. And you wrote on your form, I don't know if you remember this, but in what well, part of your story you're most passionate about, you wrote, reunion is hard. Mm. And so, like, you even talked about the beauty of watching that video and then inserting yourself into that piece. And that's hard. Like, that's difficult. I was wondering yeah. if you could just speak a little bit more to your personal experience with reunion and the difficulties that, you know, that you've either faced or gone through or overcome yeah. on this journey and what that looks like continuing forward. Yeah. It, so I met, I'll just go back. I, I met my birth mother and my four sisters in a room at Eastern, one of the like crying reunion rooms right it's kind of sweaty and weird smells and all that stuff (laughs) Um, and uh, we had two translators because there were so many of us um and my husband was there actually too um and it was good it was awkward though you know um because it's you're not talking directly to each other you're talking to each other but they're a translator and it's Mm. really strange i mean it was great but it was a strange experience um, to have so many emotions and all this stuff, and then you look the same, and and um, I, I mean, it was a, a privilege, you know. I I know I would acknowledge it's such a huge privilege um, to to have that moment. Um, and then uh, later in the trip, I went to Daegu. I took the train to Daegu um, along with a translator, and I um, went to my second oldest sister's house. Um, we had blueberries because I was pregnant and the only one of the only things I wanted to eat were blueberries. Okay. Mm. Um, and apparently they're a real delicacy in Korea. Like they're super expensive, which totally makes sense. Cause it's like, Oh, like I guess a lot of the blueberries we get like come from California or whatever. So, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then we went to like a, a buffet because that's what you do in Korea. You go to the buffet. 
Um, and it was, it, I mean, the translator, um, you know, she was great. It was still strange. And there were jokes I didn't get, you know, she wasn't, she was great, but she wasn't quite fast enough sometimes and the jokes didn't make sense. Mm. And then, um, yeah, and that was it. And then I said goodbye to them at the train station and I, I cried, you know, with them to, through the train station, walking through the train because I realized I was never, I might not ever have that moment again. Um, I bawled like a baby and then I got on the train. And of course, I haven't seen them since. And then, uh, you know, it's a little bit of talking on cacao. But apparently, my sister um, that I do talk to, um, Imsuk, has communicated to me that the older sisters actually don't really even talk to her. Um, I'm the only one that really talks to her. So she doesn't have a close relationship with mm. them or their or their families, which is very interesting. Um, so I feel like they're really out of reach. You know, sure. I, I don't really hear from them. I stopped hearing from my birth mother, which is, I kind of, kind of like just accepted it. Like she knows I'm okay. She said her piece. Um, you know, I think she cares about me. I care about her, but we're just not like going to be like sure. super tight, which is, which is totally okay with me, I think. Um, and then it's just, I really want to have a, a real relationship with my youngest sister, but it's so elusive. Like it just doesn't feel real. Um, we did try to talk one time, like through cacao, like on like the phone kind mm. of, um, and it was really awkward, sure. <laughs> um, you know, using a translation app or whatever. It just felt really awkward. So we haven't done it since. Um, it's, it's, she seems so great and we have a lot in common. It seems like, but uh, there's, I definitely have like a lot of sadness that, that there's a big barrier i feel like like cultural and language like there's definitely some cultural mm. things but they're, they're really different in korea yeah thank you yeah moving back to your uh i know we're um may move on to food here shortly but moving back to your um your writing uh you said that you would want to read a little excerpt from one of your pieces is that still oh, sure something you wanted to do <laughs> i guess so bring it on you <laughs> Not to like get, not to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. The title of this one is A Wraith, um, and it was published online on Fatal Flaw a Literary Magazine. And it was actually the first piece I've ever uh, published. So, And it was actually uh, nominated for um, an anthology. So the, the quote that um, was the inspiration for this piece is, um, sometimes you are a wraith before you're given the choice of stating who you are and that ocean bong on earth are briefly gorgeous. Okay. The instant I emerge from her body at 1.05 a.m., my Korean mother begins the process of my dismemberment. She averts her eyes to avoid seeing my face and makes no attempt to hold me. The newborn she just birthed in J. Il Obstetric Clinic in Daegu City. Without these maternal gestures, I begin to disappear, still warm and wet from her body. Starting at the tips of my fingers and slowly running up to my shoulder, my tiny arms evaporate. I never have a chance to grasp my mother's finger, pick a doljabi on my first birthday, or spoon warm miyokuk into my mouth. In those early moments, I lose a part of myself without having a chance to know who that person was. My mother, too, loses a part of herself in that hour and in the days and weeks after when she tells my sisters that I'm dead. Five days later, I'm transferred 200 miles north from Daegu to Seoul, possibly by train, although I can't be sure. It goes unnoticed that on the trip, one by one, 10 pudgy toes and gradually my dimpled knees vanish. I no longer own the legs that in the womb tickled my mother gently at first, then in the final weeks of pregnancy kicked her so violently she wondered if a foot might punch through her skin. Without my legs, I won't chase my five older sisters in the fields or learn to crawl on the floor of our family's one-room shack. At four months old, I'm flown 14 hours across continents and the ocean on a plane full of female social workers and screaming Korean infants, all of us barreling towards new families and shiny American futures. As I pass through time zones and move further and further from the origin of me, the center of who I could have been, more of my infant body dematerializes into the clouds. First, my abdomen full of warm formula, along with my newly formed belly button, the birthmark on my lower back, and finally, my tiny beating heart. We touched down in a foreign country on May 19, 1983. By the time my adoptive parents received me at the airport gate, I'm reduced to a little more than a head full of 
lice infested black hair. My new parents take me as I am, not understanding they're getting only a scrap of who I once had been. They tell themselves I don't sleep well those early nights with them because I'm jet lagged. I don't sleep because in the four short months of my life, I've lost large portions of myself, not only body parts, but my language, family, and culture. I've been erased by the racist capitalist systems and institutions that moved me fiercely along the transcontinental adoption pipeline. Even though I still have a face, it's when I don't recognize a stranger's face. As I grow older, I will wish I had been graced its removal too. She makes me uncomfortable with her thin, monolithic eyes, wide cheeks, and thick, thick, dirty lips. I train myself to avoid looking in mirrors or to scrutinize the person I see in them, often digging down bitten nails into her cheeks to create speckles and pinching her flat nose to make it perky. It is a face that belongs to no one I know. I don't see her in my white family or in the various white spaces I find myself in. The more I fail to see her, the more I forget I'm Korean. The erasure metastasizes in my mind, convincing me I'm white and flattening my Korean history into a quaint footnote. I try to recall who I was before I was deleted. Parts of me have begun to appear in strange and painful ways. An index finger with dry cuticles here, a droopy breast there, the pair of flat feet, size six and a half. What do I do with these body parts when they show up unexpectedly and don't fit together? How do I make sense of a crime 39 years ago? I'm not sure I'll ever be whole again like I was in those first innocent moments of my life. Most of the time, it's probably easier and less painful to exist in these manageable parts and pieces that way I can be tucked into tidy boxes and pushed conveniently under the bed having a whole body attracts attention it elicits questions there's awkward moments of pretending I've always had a body that I know who I am instead I prefer to fill in my missing limbs with words English words of course I string words together to explain the suspension I feel in my life caught between who I am and who I could have been With those words and the words of fellow adoptees, I rebuild myself into something completely new, not Korean, not American. I'm molded by the strength of the adoptee community. Now when I bleed, I bleed dreams of our stories from my veins, the fear, the shame, and the grief and grace we carry with us daily. Wonderful. Amazing. Sorry, that was really long. (laughs) No, that was so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, like I said, the, some of the words in that really, really resonate with me, the, you know, who I am and who I could have been, um, you know, not quite American, not quite Korean. There's, there's so much in there. It's great. Thank you. I'm glad you guys. Yeah, thank it. you for that. That was, yeah, that was incredible. It was real oh. visceral and, uh, and evocative, um, and provocative, I think in ways that I don't have the opportunity to hear in a single piece in a way that I so deeply resonate with. Um, yeah. It was really good. And I can't wait to read more of your stuff. Um, Thank will you. you tell people where to find your works and get connected with you? Sure. I am, I have a website. It's my name. <laughs> it's your name. <laughs> I don't know if you know. <laughs> it's Sarah J. Streeter, um, dot com. And um, I'm on Twitter, but... Um, but now you don't know if you want to be on Twitter. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> and I'm on Instagram, but it's really just like personal stuff. So I would say my website is probably the best place to reach me. So, yeah. Thank you so much. You for heard her first. Me. It's her name, <laughs> Sarah J. Streeter. Thank you for being so patient with us and yes. flexible as we worked to find time to get you on our calendars. That was 100% our fault. And, and really, really appreciate it. Two. Yeah, so, so congratulations on your second yeah. child. I mean, and baby number one. Let's be real. Let's not throw any shade. Thank you. That's true. Thank you. We love Having both of your babies on. equally. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Food time. Is it food time? Let's, let's do it to it. Neck. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to the John Chi Show food portion. Today, we are eating caramel maple corn by Crown. But I believe wait. this is a Canadian snack. It's so, just yes. made in Korea. <laughs> I, I was going to say. Wait, 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 wait. wait sorry. <laughs> is there an echo? Yes, I can hear it now. Okay. We've come too far. We've come, yeah. Leave all this we're, in. We're one minute in. Leave all this in. Leave, Leave all of it in. in. I don't know about all that. Uh, all right. 
So we are eating, yes, the caramel maple corn, which says made with Canadian maple syrup. <laughs> so yes, it is Canadian in the fact that the maple syrup might be Canadian. I mean, I don't know. Can maple corn? syrup be Canadian? Yeah. What's I, more Canadian than maple syrup? I know. That's true. I really like this little green guy. Yeah, I don't know what he has to do with so this at cool. all. So cool. I like on the back it says delicious promise where the uh, expiration date is with a pinky <laughs> out. Ready to make that promise. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's the pinky promise. What's going on with the UPC code, though? I yeah, have no clue why that's squirting maple syrup everywhere, but that's crazy. <laughs> that's, I've never seen a UPC code that has that like has you know cartoons in it. But yeah, um, this is some wild packaging. This man. is a it's a crazy package and it's pretty cool. But it looks tasty. I like that they. You know, they at the front it also says enlarged to show texture. So I mean, it's pretty the large. Are not going to be that big. So I don't know. <laughs> You've opened it. All right, I'm opening it where it says open. In other news, I got a notification from 23 and Me while we were doing that interview that I have 15 new relatives. So you know how that goes. Okay, they're all like fourth cousins. Yes, <laughs> they are. Uh, my, my fourth cousin's from China? Whoa, these smell. Ugh. Yeah, so the so enlarged to show with texture. Opening. These things are huge. I don't know about the enlarged to show texture. These yeah, things are already honestly, huge. enlarged to show texture is like slightly, like 1.2x. Yeah. Like, oh, these wow. These are big. This is not what I, I expected them to be small little things. Hmm. These oh, are like the size know. of my mouth. <laughs> wait, what? Wait. I don't know if it's tasty. It's pretty you good. Don't you don't know if it's tasty. Oh. First impression, right out the gate. I pop it in my mouth. This is good. It tastes like caramel corn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Continue chewing. It tastes like the crust of buttered toast. Oh. Crust of buttered toast. I actually like that. Oh. Yeah. Actually. I get it's, that. It's, it's a lot Those sweeter good. than I it expected. It finishes as, as buttered toast. So oh, very interesting. That was a whole experience. All right. Wow. Describe that experience for me one more time. There. Okay. You pop it in your mouth. It tastes like caramel corn. Then as you continue to bite through, it begins to taste like buttered toast, like the crust. And then it just finishes as the regular, specifically buttered toast on white bread. That is a, that is maybe the most accurate description I've ever had anyone describe something I put in my mouth. And here's a funny here's a funny thing, too, on the back of it where it says artificial flavor. Those two artificial flavors are maple and bread. What, what, what is an artificial <laughs> bread flavor? What? what? That's amazing. So your bread, is that, your is bread, the bread thing from is Canada? not too far off. I don't know. Wild. Um, oh, mixed butter powder. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I like also. This is syrup made by purifying I sap from maple. I was in literally just reading that. I so. was literally just reading that. When you said that. Oh. Five servings per container. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty I mean, big bag. Big. This is a big bag. So but is that what okay. KJ. <laughs> is this what people from Quebec Quebec look like? Is that what yes. I'm getting by this? They have little glasses. What they have the sunglasses. The forest. Yeah. What is the other flag? Like there's a Canadian flag and then there's another flag. Do you know what that is? I had to look it up. It's the flag of Quebec. Oh. Uh, How? What is the adjective form of Quebec? Quebecian. Quebec. 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 Maybe <laughs> actually, no, that's, that's what I was trying to say. But it, isn't that the French word? But is there like a just an English term for Quebec, Quebec, Quebecian, 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 Quebecer? I'm from Co mm. Quebec. I can't even I'm say the Quebecer. normal name. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know Maine are Mainers, so maybe they're Quebecers. <laughs> Quebecers. <laughs> they had their own TV show back in the nineties. What? Becker? Mm. You never seen that show? No. Oh, Ted Danson, I think. I don't know. I'm 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 liking these a lot. Dude, hot take. The only Ted Danson thing that I've ever really seen is the good, the good place. place. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody under the age of how old are you? Yeah, <laughs> twenty nine. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I had to look at my watch. Mm. <laughs> anyway, back to the. Oh. I actually like these. These are like I'm extra large Cheeto puffs. Yeah, but sweet. Like I, I have to open my jaw quite. A ways to get it in there. <laughs> I will say that I actually like the buttery crust of toast. So these this snack <laughs> was made for me. <laughs> Honestly, it's great. I would eat this whole bag. 
Yeah, I, I like them. Maple corn. I mean, I guess they couldn't call it, you know, crust, edge of crust. <laughs> Red. That sounds so oh, appealing. Yeah. Yeah, I think no. they could have, and they would have had at least one buyer. <laughs> at least one. <laughs> <laughs> Tens of buyers. I kind of <laughs> wish, like, it had, like, a little bit of, like, a savory. You know what mm, I mean? Like, mm-hmm. a little bit of salt in there could be kind of good. Or, like, a little something like, like where that. Where are going with that? I like salt and Maybe some bacon into bits. soy sauce. Ooh, eat this with soy sauce. Bacon? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Bacon or soy bacon. sauce. Bacon would be really Candy good. Bacon. Ooh, For yeah. more sweetness. Oh, yeah. Candy bacon. Ooh. <clears throat> okay. Okay. My first thing was a joke. I hope, that, I hope that no one is like, what? KJ would do that? No, he would never. Although he's <laughs> shaking his head vigorously. did light uh-huh. up when Sarah mentioned fries with Old Bay seasoning. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was like, yeah. Before we go, we have I can to, go, Nathan had I a can go back to that now that, that we're at the food portion. So <laughs> I've never had old day on anything other than I think like the seafood. So oh. they they put it on fries over there too. Sometimes, yeah. Oh, okay. You said that and Nathan goes and then he was like, and then he was just waiting to ask you a question about the fries. And it was literally KJ, like, KJ asked you another question. Yeah, but like when I you said that, like you. something went off in his brain. Like he just turned like, he was like, wait a second. Old Bay seasoning. Interesting. I, I'm just waiting for this this podcast to end, and then I'm running out to the store to buy some old Bay We're going to, and fries. Fries. We're going to McDonald's. He really was. Seasoning. There will be a John G. Reel tomorrow morning accompanying this podcast. Um, that is him trying. Old Bay on some fries. Everything. Yeah. yeah. On every- <laughs> My mind has been blown. Maybe these caramel maple corn <laughs> with Old Bay. Hmm. Incredible. Sweet, All right. Well, speaking of old, spicy. Speaking, speaking of Old, old Bay, what what rating do you give these maple crunchies? That's an incredibly gracious transition. <laughs> I'm. Yeah. I. I I'm here for the whole bag, too. I'm going to have to say it's probably a five out of five for me. Ooh. What about you, Sarah? I think it's uh, it's like four you and a half. You give percentages. Four, mm. ooh, four, I'd say four and a half. Four, four point seven five. Ooh. How about that? Four That's and three quarters. Yeah. Why, what, are you, what are you rating that on? Oh. um, I like them. I like the sweet... <laughs> I like them. I like them. End of story. <laughs> I, I wish, like I said, I wish there was like a hint of salt. The texture, I wish they were a little lighter. More like one of those cheese puff things. Mm. Like less, a little less toasty, more like a cheese ball. Sure. My American the same circumference as mm-hmm. a cheese ball. And I want mm-hmm. it to be. But now, there's a lot more of it. Yeah, I don't yeah. want it to hurt like- my mouth. I don't want it to hurt my mouth. <laughs> Oh, I so, thought you said you uh, do. You're like, I want this to hurt like I'm eating Captain Crunch. <laughs> Captain Crunch, right? Yeah, cut I my gums up. Loser, my Captain gums. Crunch. It'll destroy your gums. <laughs> Caramel maple corn. Not as bad on for your mouth as Captain Crunch. Uh, I'm giving it a 10 out of 5. I'm giving it two fives. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. I'm not going to lie. When you ever. described it as the crust of burnt toast, burnt buttery toast, I was like, I love that. I'm here for the the <laughs> crust of toast, and wow. that's honestly is what this is. And the snack is right up my alley. So, two fives. Nice. Whoa, that wow. is uh, that's a, a historic moment for our show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to bring it right back down to earth. Um, I'm going to give it a four point eight. Mm, okay, it's, a, it's it's it is really solid. I don't I don't know. If I like the size, if I like the mm. circumference of mm. the sure. thing, mm-hmm. sure. but I do like that it's a proper mouthful. Um, it is calorically expensive to eat. Mm. I think if you were to, if you were to put in one serving being 150 yeah. calories, like the number of puffs that is, is like <laughs> probably seven puffs. Oh, well, it says and that's one cup as a serving size. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, however much a cup is, it's probably like <laughs> yeah, seven. Eight, so eight, I'm seven, like. Eight. I, These are big. I think I'm just used to Korean snacks being like more dense for like calorie the trade off, you know. Yeah. So when I really like something, I'm like, and this is great because I can eat like a thousand of them. So <laughs> these, I'm like, well, this is just like a normal American snack. I'm gonna get fat if I eat all of them. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's really, really good. It's just not. It's not a five for me. I don't know what would what would take it there, but mm. it is really good. So I'm I can give you some of my points. Four point eight. I can give you some of my points. Get no, bring you not, back up. That's not how that works. That's not an <laughs> averaging system. 
still all around. This seems to be a very high rated product. So good job, Crown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good job, Crown. Yeah. Excellent product. Yeah. Good job, Canada. Good job, Canada. Good job, Canada. Good job we got Quebec. We got oh, Quebec Canada. and their maple syrup. Because it does say it comes from the maple syrup of Quebec. So, yeah. Quebec. Nice. Good job. Quebec or syrup. Good job, trees. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get that one again. That's good. Same. Yeah. Wow. I'm not. My kids are going to destroy it. I wouldn't say no to it. (laughs) I'm just incredibly lazy is the thing. (laughs) You are lazy. (laughs) Sarah, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story with us, sharing your work with us. Um, Incredibly beautiful and powerful. Uh, For viewers on YouTube, if this is going to be on YouTube. Nope. Just kidding. For all the listeners who (laughs) may have skipped directly to the food portion, where can people find your work again? Or connect uh, with you? Uh, on my website, Sarah J. Streeter. It's Sarah without an H. So, and Important distinction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. 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 Also, Sarah Streeter redirects to someone else. So Sarah, oh. J. Sarah Streeter. J. Streeter. Oh. I get the J. Yeah. My nemesis. <laughs> That's your nemesis? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Incredible. She is now. You're right here first. There could be only one. There could be only one Sarah Streeter. <laughs> She's going to go yeah. buy that website now. All That's right. It. Well, <laughs> listeners, go out, support Wait, Sarah's I was gonna work. Say, yo, oh, what, Sarah, what's the best way for us to support you oh, yeah. as call. a writer? Oh, what a question. I guess uh, like moral support is huge, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and if I end up publishing a book one day or something like that, actually, I'm going to have a short story um, published in like an actual physical literary journal, um, oh, or the cool. anthology next Heck year. Yeah. Um, I'm getting paid for it. Um, it's Heck a, yes. it's a, yeah, it's a short story. So buy buy stuff, you know, when when they're it's actually physically, you know, for sale. Um, but yeah, moral support's huge. You know, it's just like, yeah. So thank you for all your kind words tonight and for of giving course. me a, a chance to to talk to you guys. This yeah, is really this is really fun. It's always a great time, even more of a great time when we can support you in the ways that you need support. Yeah. So even more of a great time when Patrick drops a five double five out of five rating. So yeah. that is true. So <laughs> listeners, moral support and buy that stuff when it becomes available, which it is currently not. Okay. Oh, and, will be soon. and maybe share share stuff. Uh, yeah, that too. Yeah, we will Sharing definitely stuff blast as well, it out right? on our socials. But yeah, word of mouth and just like that traction goes a long way. Yeah. So. If you're in the 100%. publishing company, give her a shout. Yeah. I'm sure there's a listener in there who knows a friend who's like, yeah, you should take a stuff. So, exactly. Yeah. Use your networks, people. Use that network. Use that community. And if you want to network and build community with us, you can do so on all the social media channels at John Cheese Show. You can also send us an email to John Cheese Show at justlikemedia.com. You can leave us a voicemail at a number that we've said on our previous uh, episodes. 972-677-8867. Hey, hey, you did it! Wow. You did it! <laughs> I was like, I don't know the number. Uh, it was like my phone is down. not. It's like the first here. time I've ever said it. There you go, people. That is the now very first call time. In. We're doing a lot of, setting a lot of milestones on this spot, or on yeah, this episode of the podcast. <laughs> Um, uh, you can support us by going to johnshishow.com backslash support. You can also buy stuff, merch, and other things at our store, johnshishow.com backslash store. You can, uh, I'm just like falling to pieces today. Um, Where can people find you, Patrick? People can find me on Instagram at Patrick in the world or on LinkedIn. Also Patrick in the world. KJ. Really? Yeah. Oh, you can create your own they custom have. URLs. Oh, on LinkedIn. nice. All right. Uh, Gotta yeah, do it for the I'm, brand, baby. Nice. I'm online at KJ Relke, wherever you want to be found on the internet. I am on Instagram and Nowak and uh, Nathan Nowak on Facebook. Oh, wait. Side note. Um, I had a, a single drop recently. Thanks to everyone who's listened and shared it. I really appreciate it. Ew. Go do the same thing for Sarah's work. Yes. Yay. Ooh. Yes. That was great. It Thanks. was great. All right. Anyways. We've clearly forgotten how to end the show. So <laughs> thank you, Until Sarah, again for joining week. us. Until next week. John Chi. Hey, yo. Cut, 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 cut.